good afternoon. Sorry about hey, the everyone. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the um, late de delay. Thank you, everybody, for waiting patiently in the waiting room to get started. Well, thank you, guys. For, actually, uh, I almost called you to cancel it. My uh, Mac, for some reason, did not open my pa my password. Would not work unless uh, except on the safe mode for some reason. So yeah. I had to like uh, it's I've been like working on it for for two or three hours and just work. We would out. have um, just let you talk for thirty minutes. No PowerPoint needed. Just no. I, I actually actually got 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 it got it got it got it, got it, got it, got it like like figured it out just like half an hour ago. So we're fine. But I need your help. I don't know how to uh, share my. Um... Um, just go to the bottom um, of the screen, and there should be like a row of icons, and the one in the, there should be one a green one that says. Oh, share. got it. Okay. 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 And not not a ton of introduction needed for Hassan. I think everybody probably knows you, but Hassan Alloway is our, our dedicated cardio hospitalist who has advanced heart failure training, who we're working very hard to get all of his skills utilized efficiently on our service, but are thankful that you're um, putting some time in, into education for us to share your wealth of knowledge. All right. Are we, uh, are we all ready? Yep, go for it. Cool, perfect. So, um, so it's, it's kind of this is kind of tailored for uh, for mostly for APPs because uh, I know they do up most of our admissions. I know that they're mostly the ones who actually attend this uh, session. Uh, um, I, I made it like as uh, as you know as small as I can because I like to hear questions. It's, it's more about like you know uh, getting an insight for what people are actually um, uh, you know having trouble with when they admit and take care of patients with heart failure. Uh, but I just, you know, I went over mostly e um, everything in brief uh, and tried to make it as uh, as uh, concise as I can. So the one, the things that I'm going to go over are uh, the primary assessments for acute heart failure. Uh, first of all, very briefly for a new diagnosis of heart failure, what, what, what should be ordered on the first admission? Uh, and acute deco decompensated uh, chronic heart failure, what should we be going over? Uh, how to treat and things. Uh, assessment, physical exam, uh, you know, is, exam is for me is, is, the, is the the best, and we know it's actually the, the best to uh, to identify a lot of uh, factors. Diuresis, salt and water, uh, worsening kidney function. Why diuresing? It's the most common problem uh, we encounter while diuresing someone. GDMT, whatever that means. Uh, iron therapy and redness for discharge. All right, guys, let's get it started. So uh, uh, for new onset heart failure, I'm just gonna you know, put this right, right now, just because um, you know, we do in encounter this quite often. The problem with this is you know, for, for admission, we do not really know if it's systolic or diastolic when somebody gets admitted with volume overload. So you know, they call us for emergency for a new admission. We know it's, it's probably heart failure, but we don't, do not know the, the type. But these are the basic stuff that we have to get for every patient because it, it makes, it gives us a lot of, um, insight for uh for uh for what what's going to happen next in terms of how to uh how to uh, uh figure out the etiology of heart failure so we have to get a very good history including uh you know uh, uh symptoms of chest pain uh when did symptoms start any history of the past uh, stuff and 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 then we have to get a very very good uh, you know, family history, because if 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 a patient comes in and, and even if it's fifty or sixty and tells me that all his family has heart failure, then I'm, I'm assuming it's you know it's there's something familiar there. There's something as a dilated cardiomyopathy, unless he says well they had cabbage and stuff. So family history is very essential. We have to always remember that with with ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, the a family history of of coronary artery disease significant below the age of sixty five doubles the risk factor. So. Uh, so that's why we really have to focus on the family history. And EKG is essential also to help us identify uh, ischemic uh, signs versus signs of amyloid, for example. Uh, so EKG is important. Renal function panel, it's a, it's a given on admission. We always get it. But I like to mention renal function panel and, and not BMP. So BMP on admission misses the albumin, and it's a very, very good factor to look at when we are diuresing, you know, it's, it's one of the signs of, uh, of, of, you know, figuring decongestion. Uh, so I like to have a renal function panel on admission really helps. A BMP, of course, it's not mentioned here, but it's always a given from the ED admission. Hepatic function panel, uh, because rarely, I'm not, I'm not sure I've seen it 
I've never seen it actually like a hemochromatosis, but you know, it's always worthy to mention. Thyroid function panel, because we've seen a lot of uh, thyroid related uh, cardiomyopathies, including, you know, precardial tamponade sometimes. Uh, drug screen, it helps all the time, you know, and it, it makes it makes you feel confident whenever you see a positive drug screen that this, this is what I'm dealing with and makes us feel that second day when we're dealing with the patient that we can discharge them faster because uh, usually people with cocaine abuse kind of uh, decline fast, but they recover fast as well on during the admission. All right, so uh, syndrome that we deal with is, and this is only for the identification and the, the, uh, the, uh, the definition, have is less than 40, half path is more than 50, ejection fraction and half, and mild reduced ejection fraction is 40 to 50%, and heart failure with improved ejection fraction, that's, these are patients who were less than 40%, and now they're more than 40%. Now, the reason they changed the, the naming, actually it didn't change a whole lot, it was heart failure with, with, uh, with, with mildly reduced, now it's mid-range, it's actually still MR anyway, uh, but the reason they changed the, uh, you know, they, they made this name is because there's some lack in the evidence with what we call um, uh, GDMT for the heart failure with, 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 with the mid-range ejection fraction. So that's why, you know, the, that's why the, cha the, the, name, uh, the change of name. Um, um, I will talk about it in, in brief as well, how to treat and what, what evidence we have. Um, and last, of course, is improve, improved ejection fraction. The reason they put this in there for definition is because they like we like patients to stay on therapy even if they improve their ejection fraction. So, say somebody is on Entresto or Bitoprol, and they improve their ejection fraction from like twenty percent to forty five percent, even though there is no good evidence for the Entresto anymore. But it's preferable to keep these patients on as long as they're tolerating it. All right, now. With an acute, and please guys stop me uh, whenever there's a question. Um, I cannot see the chat, so uh, uh, while looking at the screen, so just uh, uh, let me know. With an acute decompensation, we have to look at the onset of symptoms. It's very important because it can tell us if it was soon after discharge, which means it was not effective diuresis uh, during the admission. Yeah. We're good. Uh, so, and, and if it started, for example, like two or three weeks after discharge, which means then, then the, um, the uh, home direct regimen is not enough. It's not suitable for this patient. So we have to really, you know, focus on the onset of symptoms and how did they start? Did they start with, uh, with volume overload or with signs of redistribution? The, the mean of the redistribution, not volume overload is some people get a low output state. So even though they have the same uh, weight, they look volume overloaded, they're redistributing their volume, their own volume, because they have a very low cardiac output state. Usually these patients do not end up in, on our service because they are, they are in, in, in cardiogenic shock. But we have to always look at and ask the patient, what's your dry weight? If they can tell us what's their dry weight, meaning what was their weight on the best heart cath they had when they had, you know, they had dry volumes in the heart cath, was their, their best volume and they could do whatever they wanted to do on their best day, what was their weight then? This is what we can identify on, like what's the dry weight or the weight on discharge if there was an effective diuresis at, uh, at the previous admission. Uh, compliance and implications on compliance. You know, we always have to ask patients if they are taking these, these medications and if they are taking the Lasix, we cannot assume that they're not. If somebody says, I am taking my Lasix, then my strategy upon discharge is changing diuretic regimen. We cannot keep him on the same diuretic regimen if he said, I've been taking this, this, this uh, dose that you gave me. And, you know, we encounter this quite often. I cannot tend to change the regimen every time I discharge someone anyway, uh, except with, uh, with cocaine abuse, because they usually just come in and out very fast and they respond to very slight doses of Lasix. Um, and if there's non-compliance, we have to ask why. Um, sometimes even the small copay of Entresto is not tolerated by patients, so we have to always ask why. Um, although in our population, it's mostly, it's mostly not because, you know, there is a lot of cheap medicine out there. Now, I, I do not want to talk about hemodynamics in details. I just like to, you know, just to put this out there, just to like um, uh, get a small brief look at what we, what we care for. Uh, we have to always remember, whenever we look at a heart cath or, or acute decompensated heart failure, what we're trying to estimate is volume. We're trying to estimate if somebody has a lot of volume on him. 
uh, by looking at pressures. So we, we, when, we, when we're examining patients, we're examining their pressures, we're examining their signs of a high pressure. We're not examining their volume per se. And that's what we do with the heart cath as well. We actually try to use the pressure numbers to estimate the volume load or overload or, 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 or dehydration or whatever. So, so, and the signs of a, a volume up are, are, the, are the upper chamber of the heart. So let's say we're, 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 we're evaluating the RV function today. We're looking if somebody has an, a bad RV function. Our sign of a bad RV function is his RA pressure. So somebody's RA pressure is high, means he has a bad RV function. Somebody has an LA pressure that's high, means it has an LV, bad LV function. Now, what does that mean? So somebody comes in with well, signs of congestion, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema on, 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 uh, on chest x-ray, hypoxic, whatever. He's, he's volume up from heart failure. That means I'm, I'm, I'm thinking his left atrial pressure is high. That, you know, that's, that's our sign for a bad LV function. His LA pressure is high, his wedge pressure, which is the LA pressure basically, is high. And that's why he has, a, he has pul pul like pulmonary edema. Now I cannot really value that it's very hard to estimate the left atrial pressure. There are signs, there are, there are some stuff that we can use clinically, but actually there's, it's not much. It's just like two physical exam findings that we can look for a high LA pressure and we cannot use them readily. I mean, it's, it's really very, very, very hard to estimate. So what we look at is other signs of high RA pressure, a bad RV function, a high RA pressure, and signs and clinical signs of higher pressure that would tell me that probably the LA pressure is high. Does it make sense for everyone? So just remember that when we're looking at someone with decompensation, we're trying to estimate what his left atrial function is to see if he needs a lot of Lasix. And our ways so far have been looking at signs of RV decompensation. Uh, we should not mention a whole lot like by V failure or acute by, it doesn't really make any difference. You know, the volume is the volume. And if somebody has an LV dysfunction, you know, he will have an RV dysfunction. It, eventually he will. It doesn't really change much. So I'll, I'll, go, I'll go backwards a little bit again to look at the hemodynamics and just discuss what we're looking at here. But this is the, the only reason I put this here is just to look at the RA. RA is high. And the way we estimate the LA is by looking at the wedge pressure. It's very high. So a normal RA is five or seven or eight, excuse me, less than eight is what we look at when we diary someone. And a wet pressure less than 25, I mean 15, but less than 25 is when we feel comfortable that this, this person is probably not having pulmonary edema. The definition of pulmonary edema, you know, in the, in the past when somebody does not have acute uh, chronic heart failure was 25 uh, wedge pressure. So these are the signs that we look at. And then everything else is just to, trying to help us with, with with, the, with what's going on inside the heart. Okay, now signs for a high RA pressure. This is why I mentioned this before I went over the exam. So physical examination, these are the essentials. Signs of high RA pressure are these, orthopnea. Now, orthopnea is actually a sign of high LA pressure, but these are the only signs in this specific study that Dranzer, by the way, he did a lot of studies in heart failure. He's the one that you know we all read about Dranzer. So all of the signs and symptoms and stuff came up from, from this guy. So in this particular study, uh, he found that orthopnea and JVD are the only markers of elevated wedge pressure more than 30, which defines pul pulmonary edema. So a JVD more than 12, look at the odds ratio, it's really significant from like 4.6 with not crossing the, the, uh, the one, one line, it's, it, it's the same for orthopnea. So when somebody comes in and he tells me that I look at his neck vein and it's positive, it's high, and he has orthopnea more than two pillows. I'm, I'm confident that he has pulmonary edema. I'm confident that Lasix is gonna be good for him, right? Now, if this didn't work, for some reason, the patient's neck is wide, he's obese. I could not really evaluate the, the, the neck vein. And orthopnea can be just because of sleep apnea or something, he just could not tell me. He just sleeps on, on his side, which is very, very common. A hepatojugular reflux can sometimes help us. Now, of course, uh, you know, we have to remember to put pressure for up to 10 seconds and wait for that elevation by at least four to five on, on their neck vein, uh, just to see if there is a, a significant elevation in the, in, the, in the neck vein. Roughly just to, you know, just have small clinical pearls. Whenever we're, we're examining neck veins, we're looking at the, at the, at, at the neck, we're looking at uh, pulsations. And there are two pulsations. 
that we're gonna see on the neck. And there's the carotid, which is the most common, you know, to, to mistaken with the JVD, and there is the, the neck vein, the JVD. So, we, and the main, the main factor to differentiate is to look at a double pulsation. You know, a, a JVD or, you know, the jugular vein or the vein has two pulsations. Now the carotid has the same pulsation as a as a regular pulse. So whenever we're looking at the neck vein, at the at the neck, and we have double pulsation or a faster pulsation than the than the patient's heartbeat, we kind of can tell this is probably the, the, the vein of the artery. Now, if we still cannot tell, then we can press on the bottom of, of the neck just to just to see if we can actually occlude the neck vein, and if it disappeared, then probably this is a vein, but you have to really put a good significant amount of pressure in there to, you know, to, to get rid of the vein. So it's not really easy and patients might not like it, but we use it sometimes, you know, it does help us uh, to estimate the neck vein. We love it because this is the best estimate for when the patient is ready for discharge, changing to oral diuretics, whatever. JVD is the best sign that you can ever get on a patient. You know, it is the exact number that we look at when, we, when we're looking at a JVD, we're estimating the artery pressure, it's the same number with a variation of two to three millimeters of mercury. And roughly, if, if you're looking at it and it's on the base of the neck, we call it eight. And that's because that's around three centimeters from, the, from, the, from, from where the level, level of the atria is. So we call it seven or eight at the base of the neck. We call it 15 at mid neck and we call it 20 or above when it's at the, at the angle of the mandible. So you can you can guesstimate whenever you look. You don't have to really measure it with a, with a ruler or something. That's my rough, these are my rough numbers: seven or eight, fifteen, and then twenty or above. Whenever whenever it's on the angle of the mandible, we're seeing these pulsations here that we cannot really tell. We can we can just say it's probably twenty or something, but there is no way you can tell what the accurate number is because it's hidden behind the behind the mandible. So these are the, the signs. Whenever I look at it, I can just say, well. You know, it's kind of on the lower end of the neck, so I'm calling it 12 today. This just helps me for the next day to tell if I'm leaving the service. I can tell the, the next provider that it was around 12 the day before. So if it was not appearing on, on, on the neck the next day, you can stop the diuretics probably and switch to orals. All right, so... Uh, huh? Quick question on JVD, just for kind of everyone on physical exam skills. What angle do you have the patient's head positioned when you're assessing JVD? That's a great question. So between 30 and 45 is what we really look at. I like the 45, but you have to remember, whenever it's uh, whenever you do not see it well, when the patient is lying on a 45 degree or a 40 degree, usually sit them up because when it's so high, you cannot see it when they're, when they're, when they're inclined get him to sit up. I have, I have a tendency to actually, when I, when I listen to the lung, to look at the neck vein as well anyway, because when, when you know, and it's quite, quite common, you know, you send somebody to the cath lab and you look at, a, you cannot see a neck vein on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on an angle. And you think, well, he has edema, but he doesn't have a neck vein. I don't think the artery pressure is high. You get surprised when they come back, the artery pressure is probably 25 or 30 or something. That's because it's hidden, so you can see it. So get him to sit up. Uh, and that would help a whole bunch to actually get to see the, uh, the, the JVD. All right, so bendopnea. This, this came up recently. This came up after I started cardiology training. Uh, it, it, uh, so they, you know, we've, they found that, that, that bending downwards for up to 30 seconds, if you get somebody to bend down uh, to like tie their shoes or like, you know, uh, or like wear their socks or something, they would tell you actually, if you just ask them, when you bend down to tie your shoes or like wear your socks, do you feel short breath that you have to come back up? And this is very, very commonly a, a, a positive answer for people who have pulmonary edema. This is a sign of, of increased congestion. As you can see, they looked at both when people have actually pulmonary edema and not, not pulmonary edema. It does tend to increase anyway, even if they're not, they don't have a high wedge pressure, but it does tend to increase significantly when somebody has a high wedge pressure to the point that when, whenever they bend, to the point that they will feel the symptom. Remember, above 30 or 25 is pulmonary edema. So whenever it, in, the, the pressure, the LA pressure increases by that much or the wedge pressure increases by that much, they will feel the symptom, they will get winded, short breath, and they will go back to where they, they will feel comfortable. So that's, that's, that's a good sign. I usually ask patients to actually monitor this at home, and that would be their sign to double up on the Lasix if they get more of, of the bendopnea. It is very easy to teach patients about, about, about this kind of sign. Um, now, on exam, uh, we have to look for signs of low output state. 
Usually, again, these do not end up on our service, but you know, sometimes briefly from the emergency, they come in, they have some volume on them, and they have a low output state then, and then you can you can tip them over, you know, to the uh, to the to the left side of of the of the of the, of the Frank Starling curve, and you can get them better and lose that low output state. So it can happen uh, to have them on our service, but a good sign is a proportional pulse pressure. All that means is a very narrow pulse pressure. If somebody comes in, the blood pressure is 100 over 80. That that he is telling me that my my cardiac output is not high. So you know the easiest way to measure it is, or actually the only way is systolic minus diastolic over diastolic. And if the ratio is less than 25 percent, this is more common, more often than not, to have a low output state, which is a cardiac index of less than 2.2. Less than 2.2 of cardiac index defines cardiogenic shock in the setting of an end, end, end organ damage. You remember, we have to remember that cardiogenic shock does not come without end, or, end, end or, organ, organ damage. Uh, so we have a lot of people, who we, we used to call them walking cardiogenic shock because they're walking around. They have a low cardiac index, but they're walking around fine. They're having no low output symptoms, okay? So these are the signs of low output state. This is the big one. And then, and then if they are cold, now the other signs that actually tell us if patients have, you know, uh, uh, have, uh, let me just move this a little bit, okay, uh, have have uh, have a high wedge pressure as well, have, have I know high high uh, RA pressure. So we mentioned the, of course, orthopnea. This is a given. We always ask the patients to you know for two pillow orthopnea, and almost always they always answer that well, well I sleep on my side. This is usually a non. Um, uh, an indirect, you know, indirect sign of orthopnea if they sleep on their side because they prefer their side. Bendopnea, as we mentioned, JVD, ascites, and edema, all these are signs of high filling pressures. Now, blood pressure response to Valsalva, if you, if you, if you, if somebody wants to look at this, this is very, very, very interesting. The blood pressure response to Valsalva and what, what, whatever we used to call the, uh, uh, the, uh, the square sign, which is in the late phase of Valsalva, blood pressure should drop in the Third phase of Valsalva, blood pressure should drop. And it does not when, you, when somebody has a high LV and diastolic pressure, or the LA pressure is high, but the, there's a lot of volume, then the blood pressure would not drop by the third phase. And they used to call this the square sign or the increased blood pressure response during Valsalva. Now, mind you have to measure the blood pressure three times while the patient is having a Valsalva maneuver. This is not, <laughs> I'm not even performing this. But we, we kind of actually see it uh, sometimes indirectly whenever somebody gets admitted. We know that patients who get admitted for heart failure, they often have a high blood pressure. Now, it's not always because they're not compliant. And it's not always because, uh, you know, they need more blood pressure medicines. It actually can be because they have a lot of volume on them. And uh, there's a lot of volume, intraventricular volume. And that's what, what sometimes can drive the systolic blood pressure to be actually higher than normal. Um, so these, uh, you know, in, in this study, in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the American, American College of Pathology, these are the signs that told us that these, that patients have volume on them or low output state. These are the signs that told us that, uh, uh, you know, we have a state of acute decompensated heart failure. Remember that ROWs are not a good marker for for uh, for volume because it's not it's not because it's, if it's positive it's 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 insignificant no that's the other way around if it's negative it does not mean anything because chronic heart failure patients what they have is a very advanced lymphatic system so they can actually draw all the fluid from from the from the intraalveolar space freely without having rouse on exam or pulmonary edema or congestion on a chest X-ray okay so that's why it's it cannot be a good positive marker. Uh, uh, looking for, for congestion. All right. Uh, okay. All right. So low output state, these are the signs. Uh, fatigue. When somebody comes in and tells me, well, I'm, I'm not feeling short of breath winded when I walk. All I feel is fatigue, tired, dizzy, lightheaded. I cannot walk a couple of steps. I get dizzy and I have to sit up, sit, sit down. This is a big sign. Sleepiness, of course. Proportional, proportional pulse pressure that we mentioned a minute ago and cold extremities. We have to remember that cold ex extremities are a, not a bad sign at all for an acute decompensation. Cold extremities would draw me to actually drop, a, drop the beta blocker dose. I try not to stop it altogether unless I know the cardiac output has been low on a recent admission. I try to like drop it because 
uh, having reflex tachyarrhythmia can be detrimental. So uh, uh, cold extremities are, are usually what we look at on exam. Now, uh, uh, somebody taught me that if, you, if, if they are cold, they are cold, but if they are warm, they still may be cold. Remember, this is only during, whenever you're doing uh, advanced heart therapy stuff. In our service, this should, this should not be the case, but it doesn't mean that we should not look for it because uh, it can end up by, by our, on, on our service or actually get worse while admitted and then need to be transferred. Usually, if you diary someone effectively on the first day, usually, you actually get rid of uh, this thought or idea. I usually think of, uh, of a patient after after two days of admission or one day of admission that they're on cruise control because they get when they get better on the day on day one, they're gonna keep getting better. It's very very uncommon unless somebody you know of course uh, has a history of very low upper state. Now, uh, my favorite salt. <laughs> there is not a single data that would that we can copy to educate patients on low salt intake in heart failure. There's none. This is a great meta-analysis that just came out in January. Uh, and uh, it just looked at every single study that we had over salt, low salt intake versus regular salt intake in patients with heart failure. There is not a single evidence to support telling our patients go to two grams per, per day. Uh, I don't think it's human, to be honest with you. I mean, it doesn't make sense. But the way I think about it is, uh, you know, nobody likes to do a job. People like hobbies. And if you make it a job, they would stick to it for a month. They would not stick, it, stick to it forever. So I like to make it easy for them. If they want to take three grams of salt, I love it. Three grams of salt is what I go to usually on my orders. I always go up to the orders and change the order set from two grams, 1.5 liters to two liters, uh, three grams. I think this is more humane and this is more close to whatever I want to tell my patient to do at home. I cannot ask him to do two grams and one and a half liters because what's going to happen is I'll be full. You know, I'll get to diuresis maybe three or four hours earlier, but he will get readmitted much, much faster. So because he's, he cannot, nobody can be compliant to that much of a salt restriction. Remember that we copied or they copied the salt restriction from from studies on hypertension, it's and and, and, and uh, it's not it's not studies on heart failure, and all of these are to just try to get it to the heart failure uh, population, but it failed. So we probably should not stick to it, and I do not. Salt and water should be uh, should be should be easier. You know, we tend to say we should salt restrict if it's very very hard to diarrhea someone during the, the the admission. Then then I would go very strict we should tend to do water restriction as, you know, as crazy as 1.5 liters, only if it's very hard to get their sodium up if they're, you know, severely hyponatremic from volume overload. So, uh, you know, the tendency should be two grams, uh, I'm sorry, three grams, two, two liters. And if they drink a little bit more, I think it's okay. I think it's better to actually cope with what they do at home so I do not get full. So I will be ahead in the game when they get discharged. Uh, and if, again, if, her, if their salt was, if their sodium was so low and I'm not going to diarrhea, you know, enough, that's when I would intervene and change the, the protocol. All right. Options for diuretics. Uh, we have furosemide, Bumex, hey, furosemide. Yes. I have a quick question. So <clears throat> obviously tracking every fluid ounce that they drink during the day and tracking every gram of salt that they eat from a box or from fruit or from wherever is extremely difficult. What are your thoughts on more or less stressing the importance of them knowing their dry weight and using that as a kind of a goal weight and just reinforcing it's a lot easier to get up and get on a scale every day than it is to track all the fluid and salt intakes? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree, but we usually do not ask patients to actually weigh their water intake at home. We just tell them to be to be uh, to be mindful. I usually tell tell my patients to uh, to drink to their thirst, and I do not mind if they drink more than three liters a day if they have to, because if he's gonna do it, then I have to adjust my medicines to it. Remember, you know, we're treating their symptoms; it, it, we're, we're not trying to torture them. But you know, you know, the the, the uh, whenever we mention you know intake and output and stuff, it's only inpatient. There's not a single evidence for uh, for doing it as an outpatient because 
that would be definitely not treating symptoms. That would be, you know, putting them in prison. There is no way somebody can do it at home. And I agree with you. So the way it should be done is we tell them on the discharge if it's if he's dry, and that's what that's that should be our goal, you know, to dry them up to to the to the to the to, to as dry as they can. Tell them you go home today, you weigh yourself on your own scale, and that would, would be your dry weight, and you record that weight. Now, if you gain weight by two pounds plus on a 24-hour period of time, that's your that's your that's your test. And if that happens, then you have to double up your diuretics. I usually tell them for three to five days, then go back to the um, to the regular dosing. This is what what is called uh, flexible diuretic dosing on discharge. This is th this has been studied actually, and and uh, that's in the guidelines now. So we should teach our patients to do exactly what you said, get them to weigh themselves. And any two pounds up, lower extremity swelling, shortness of breath, any of these signs, bend apnea, only any of these signs, then you double up on your, on your diuretic for three to five days. And when you get rid of the extra fluid, you'll go back to whatever I discharge you with. Now, and I usually tell them, well, some of my patients actually have to do this every week. Some of my patients have to do this every day, which means you have to adjust your diuretic now. It's not what I discharge you with. You can correct it when you go home. So I usually tell them Lasix, all it does, it, it's not really, there's no science behind it. All it does, it just takes some fluid off. And as soon as they know as much as I do, I feel more comfortable. Now, it doesn't mean that our population is going to abide by it, but we can keep trying. Um, so uh, diuretic options, we have, you know, Lasix, Bumex, Torsamide, and we have helpers, Chlorothiazide, Metolazone, and, and the newcomer, the 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 acid the acid the acid, the acid Now, um, for the most commonly used Lasix for semide, this is the most commonly used, uh, you know, on, on our patient population because it's very very extremely cheap. Now, all of these actually are cheap, but the, the for semide is probably one or two dollars a month, which is well, nothing. Uh, everything else is kind of a bit doubles or triples, whatever that amount is. So. You can use on discharge or, or during the admission, whatever you want. Do we want to use torsamide on admission? Probably not, because we know about the, the intestinal congestion when somebody is admitted with heart failure, that we probably want them to get IV diuretics because they would not respond uh, with oral. The reason is intestinal congestion, poor, poor absorption, and, and no response to diuretic. This is probably why they were admitted, because they got congested in the intestines as well. So Lasix and Bumex are, are our go-to go in the inpatient. What I try to, to do is stick with whatever they're on at home, say they're on Bumex at home, I try to stick to Bumex and give them more. Uh, if they're on Lasix, stick to the Lasix and give them more. And uh, rule, you can use whatever you want. You can use whatever happened in the emergency, they gave them Lasix, if they responded significantly, go by, you know, or you can use whatever, uh, you know, people have been using 2.5 of the home dose of, of Lasix and space it up. I always say three times a day. I do not think Lasix should be dosed twice a day. We know about the salt, uh, salt retention after six to eight hours. We know it's going to happen. So 12 hours uh, spaced Lasix is giving the kidney a chance to counteract everything that we've been doing. We have a lot of data to support that even if you dare someone, from water standpoint, the net salt negative output after the during the admission after discharge is very, very important. So we want them to lose all that extra salt as well. So uh, 2.5 home Lasix, transform it to, uh, to three times a day and get it done. It's, it's, uh, it's absolutely okay. Uh, and of course, IV. So we do not, we do not, so if somebody is on 40 Lasix PO a day, we're giving him what, 100, Lasix a day, okay? We're, we're not IV Lasix. We're not switching it to whatever it's equivalent in, P, in, in IV dosing, which is half, and then giving him three times a day. So we, we should be doing the, the other way. We should be giving more, not less. So 2.5 is okay, or trial, whatever happened in emergency is okay. What we have to remember is, you need to get a good urine output for 24 hours. So. Say we know what the exact amount of, of, of urine that came out within the first four hours of the Lasix dose in emergency. What we have to remember that Lasix would not work after six hours of its, of its administration. It will not. Which means with every dose of Lasix, you can add up whatever you're giving the patient. Say you're giving someone 60 TID, and after the first dose of Lasix in the emergency, which was 60, let's say, he diuresed one liter. So I know for a fact 
by the end of the 24 hour period of time, he will die with three liters, give or take. Which means with my two liters water restriction, he'll be negative one liter. Is this enough? Well, the answer is no. Because our goal is at least two liters negative a day. We can go up from three to five, but one liter negative per 24 hours means means his stay would be at least two weeks. Because in general, when somebody gets admitted from cardiac lower extremity edema, usually, and this is, there's a small study that came up a couple of, couple of years ago, actually many, many years ago, that they found the plasma volume actually for somebody who's admitted for lower extremity edema from heart reasons, uh, the volume on them would be actually close to around 85 ml per kg, which is maybe 12 pounds if somebody is, is average. So, which means if you dairy someone with one liter a day, which is one kilo a day, you're gonna keep them at least a week with, with very ineffective diuresis. So you can double this up. So if someone is diuresing that much, I'll go up on it and give them more. Uh, IV drip is my favorite, especially not in our patients, not in a new naive patient. Somebody needs AD of Lasix, means it's ADTID. And ADTID is 240, which means a drip at 10. I prefer this because I can stop it whenever I want. I can change it whenever I want. Say my patient had day six this morning, he diaries one liter so far or 500 so far and at midday, I'm not convinced this is enough. I wanna go up on it. Well, he already got his day six and I'm kind of behind. So the product, I mean, whatever people go with was, let's just do it today and let's see what happens tomorrow, which you're losing one day. That's why I like the drip and like to educate nurses. Well, I, I need to know what's the output by the midday and midday I'm intervening, I'm changing my protocol, I'm changing my whatever I'm doing. And whenever you go up to 80 of Lasix, you, you usually have to throw in a helper and helpers can be any of these medications. And a lot of studies, chlorothiazide and metolazone did not do much, did not do much different. So metolazone and chlorothiazide were kind of similar whenever like IV diaryl or PO metolazone did very similar effects when you that when uh, IV diuresing someone. So it is okay to choose any. Um, we were uh, you know, restricted on the, on the, uh, on the chlorothiazide out recently. So I kind of leave it for patients who are not responsive on very high doses of IV that, that LASIK strip. And I use metolazone as much as I can. Acetazolamide, um, uh, there was a study that they, you know, compared acetazolamide to placebo as an add-on to Lasix or Bumex. And, and they discovered that you can discharge patients one day less or maybe 0 0.8 days uh, you know, less of, of, of admission, which I'm not sure I care much about. From my own personal trial, uh, when I use it on heavily, heavily volume up patients, it did not do enough. And I had to switch back to metolazone and, or, or Daryl. So uh, I use it only when somebody is on 40 TID Lasix and he's doing okay and I just want to fasten it up a little bit, that's when I would use it, but I would not use it as, um, I would not say it's comparable to metolazone or, or chlorothiazide. Again, they compared it to placebo, not to any of the other drugs anyway. Any questions on these? Because uh, we get a lot of, you know, these usually. No? All right, go on. I, guess I just have a question on the drip because I love the idea of incorporating yeah. it more into practice. So can you give a few examples of like, exactly how to calculate that out. Yeah, so, so, so roughly, if you think about it, if somebody comes into the emergency, gets 60 or Lasix, and he does not diarrhea enough, which means he needs at least 80 or Lasix, correct? So 80 or Lasix, as, as I said before, it has to be three times a day. Three times a day of, of 80 is 240, which is a drip at 10. So, so my, my rule is whenever somebody gets admitted and they get 80 or Lasix and they diarrhea is good or okay, he's on a drip at 10. If somebody gets 40 and they there is enough, I'm not changing anything. So the only time I'm not changing anything if somebody gets 40 or 60 and they're really diuresing heavily. So I do not have to change anything. So, so my rule is if somebody needs 80 milligrams of Lasix because the, the smaller doses did not, did not do any effect or they had to be given 80 in the, in, the, in, the, in the ED, they're getting a drip at 10 to get a total of 240 per day, uh, which is 80 TID. And then whenever I put a LASIK strip as per the, uh, per the protocol from, from, the, from, the, from the Caress Heart Failure Trial, which is one of the biggest heart uh, trials to, you know, for, uh, you know, for stepping up diuresis and stuff, it was used for comparing diuresis 
high dose, low dose, and hemofiltration. But we use this protocol. We used to use this protocol a whole lot before, um, and I think it's really, really, really helpful. And that's what they did. And I think everybody now, since since that trial came out, everybody has been just using it because it, because why not? A lot of experts were were included in that trial, and they just came up with it. So if somebody is on less than 80 milligrams of Lasix, they get 40, 40 milligrams bolus and then uh, uh, and then five milligrams per hour, which goes to 120 a day, which is you know. Uh, 40 TID. So if someone was on 80 to 160, they're getting 10 an hour and they're getting metolazone. So whenever you get someone on 80 IV Lasix or 80 Lasix uh, is effective, they're going to get on a, on a 10 milligram drip and we're adding metolazone. And we go up step by step. You see the, in the trial, they went up on every, by 24 hours, your output and, uh, and decongestion symptoms. And as you can see on the on the on the on the upper part here, that's what they like to see. You know, if less than three, that's not enough. So we have to go up to the to the next grid. If it's three to three to five, well, we can continue the same. I still say three is not enough because of our restriction. It's not. It, it cannot be. It, you cannot get significant diuresis with just one liter negative a day. So I I, I try to go to the you know, larger, like to, to the high spectrum to up to the four to five liters a day. So, uh, and they, they would change accordingly. So this is basically where, where, where the drip came up. Uh, it's all from the, from the current trial heart failure, uh, trial. There, um, was a, there was a question in the chat um, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure the answer about if S8's um, the only unit that can do a LASIK strip. I think I've no. been... No, you, you can do it on, on any on any uh, on any unit because it's not titratable. It's uh, it's just a drip. They they do not mind nurses throughout the hospital do not mind using the drip. Now let let me say something. You know, if you're admitting someone overnight and they got an AD IV Lasix and they're diuresing extensively fine, you don't have to inter you don't have to intervene di different. It's okay, but throughout the hospitalization is where things can make a difference. Quite often, you know, I come in and they're diuresing, they're okay, negative, whatever a day, but it's been five or six days and they're still hanging. It just, it, that does not make sense to me. That means we're, we're missing out and we're losing time. Uh, so, so I just, you know, put on a drip and metolazone quite often. Remember, you know, uh, and, and that's something, you know, we, we, can, we can talk more about if you guys like, you know, the amount of, of diuretics you can get rid of in a 24 hour period of time depends on a lot of factors. So the way I look at it, if somebody is, you know, 45 year old heart failure, who is fit, who has normal hemoglobin and normal albumin, the reason I look at these numbers is because they are the on positive, positive oncotic pressure, uh, like, um, like movement. So whenever ha somebody has a normal hematocrit or hemoglobin and a normal um, albumin means they can draw from the extravascular space the max amount that I can push them to per day, which is what nephrologists used to use and they still use in the dialysis unit. They, they call it the plasma refill rate. That's how they estimate how much they can take off a of fluid in a single dialysis session. They use the plasma refill rate and they can calculate this based on the albumin and the hematocrit. And we can use this the same. So whenever somebody is elderly, low hematocrit, low albumin, I'm kind of more restricted. I do not go more than four liters negative a day because what's going to happen is you take, because you remember, we're diuresing patients from the intravascular space. We're not diuresing their, their edema. We're diuresing from the intravascular space through the, through, the, through the kidneys, right? And we're asking the, uh, you know, the, 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 the blood to draw all the extravascular volume down into the, into the, into the stream. Now, this depends on the, on the good oncotic pressure. So if someone hematocrit and albumin is low, they won't be able to do it as good as somebody, someone who has normal hematocrit and albumin. So an elderly patient who's cachectic with end-stage heart failure who's been in and out forever, I do not get as aggressive with how much negative a day. But someone who's young, I can tell you, I've seen six or seven liters a day negative and they're still going, they're still okay, taking all of them for, for, to, to the intravascular space. And the reason I say this, because if you get aggressive, you will see a bump in the creatinine down the road and a bump in the creatinine while they still clinically volume up. The reason is you took a lot of the intravascular volume and you have to wait for this to be drawn from the extravascular volume. The kidneys do not like it. They see low perfusion along with the low cardiac output and they bump the, and they, 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 the, the, the GFR tends to go down. And then what happens? You play the yo-yo game, you stop the diuretics, 
They get wind at your breath again, volume up for you again, play the Lasix game again, and then you play the yo-yo game throughout the hospitalization, and the patient stays here for two or three weeks just trying to get a good, a good regimen. So always remember, if somebody has any of these markers, cachectic, low albumin, low hematocrit, I would like to look at these. One of my markers to actually start thinking about oral diuretics is, is trending. That's why I like the renal function panel, because I look at albumin every day. When I see it trending up, it means that he's getting hemoconcentrated. This is one of the signs of hemoconcentration. And the better sign is hematocrit. You know, when, when the hematocrit and albumin kind of both start trending up, this is my sign that I'm hemoconcentrating him. If he's clinically dry, I stop the IV Lasix. If he's clinically volume up, I slow down on the IV Lasix. This is, that, 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 that's the way I look at it. Does it make sense, everyone? I was going to ask you about albumin because I remember talking to you about it around New Year's. Um, and there's no role for giving albumin here because it's just going to pass out so quickly. That's a great question. So, you know, with albumin, I kind of give it only with, with liver cirrhosis patients. What we know is with patients who have a, an albumin of more than two, let's say, you know, uh, roughly there was a study with one, one point, less than 1.7 or more than 1.7 for some reason. And they found that if somebody has an albumin above two, there is no role for albumin, even if liver, in liver cirrhosis patients with, with acute decompensation or an AKI or whatever. So, so the role is when, when the albumin is terribly low. You know, we know that the Lasix kind of is, is bound to the albumin, so, you know, in 90%. So only 10% is free and acting everywhere. Even, with, even in that case, giving albumin did not prove much, to be honest with you. So I, I, I kind of reserve it only to liver cirrhosis patients with a very, very low albumin, uh, less than two usually. And I kind of tend to use it whenever we have, an, we have a, a bump in the kidney function uh, with liver cirrhosis, you know, of course, with the protocol, even if it's only heart failure driven, I kind of use it then actually. And it's more treating, you know, in heart failure, I have to say it's more treating uh, uh, cosmetics than actually the patient because it doesn't change any of the outcomes. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Cool. All right. Um, on one other thing you're saying yeah. you use albumin one as a marker of hemoconcentration but two you said if it's really low then they may your like expectation of how they're going to diurese yeah so yeah that's the, so so and, and, and how they diurese how they was how they will how much they will pull from right. the extravascular space okay. so they will diarrhea fine you know we know again you know you know in theory you know oh. The pharmacokinetic connects of the Lasix, we know that it's bound to the albumin, mm -hmm. but nobody proved that it's less effective when you have low albumin. Like you know, maybe maybe at the same time people would have a, would have kidney dysfunction. That's prob probably why Lasix is not effective. Uh, but I do not think we can predict the, the, the direct response by album. I can be mistaken, but I, I, I do not think I've seen it. I think it's, uh, I think I look at it myself just to see the concentration effect. Now, this is not guided by a lot of evidence. There's just few evidence to, to guide, to, 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 to tell us this. Hematocrit is what really uh, people looked at. There are a couple of, actually, if you, if you guys care, whoever cares to look at it, there are a couple of formulas. Um, um, I think uh, there's the Warts formula, if somebody wants to look at it. That's for estimating the plasma volume. Uh, it's quite easy to, to just you know, calculate based on, um, based on the admitting hematocrit and the, dish, and the discharge hematocrit or a couple of days after the releasing hematocrit. And it tells you what the plasma volume net balance is, positive or negative. And this actually in heart failure proved, like showed a lot of good outcome because it told us that we're actually effectively diuresing someone. Uh, it, you know, it's just kind of cool, but, it, but we cannot do it on a daily basis, I think. Just to keep an eye on time, we have like seven minutes left. I don't know how many slides you have. Oof, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So worst in kidney function. This is a big thing. Uh, we see it a whole lot. And I have to say, we have to always remember, did it happen within the first three days of admission or after three days of admission? This is a very golden number to remember. If it happened within the first three days, it's probably just because of the consequence of the, of the problem that brought the patient in. Uh, uh, low volume, um, I mean, low, low output state, 
uh, uh, you know, whatever they did at home, uh, all the volume, all the extra volume, the reinvent congestion and stuff. If it happened after the third day, it's often caused by effective diuresis. And that means we call this a pseudo-worsening renal function. We try to avoid the nomenclature of, you know, calling it an AKI. I like to call it worsening kidney function, worsening renal function rather. And it's a pseudo-worsening whenever it happens after the third day when the patient is still volume. When they're dry, they're dry. And we stop the diuretics. So this is, this is what, what, you know, what, what, what we like to see. So possible reasons are low cardiac index, we mentioned before, low output state, cardiogenic shock. This is a reason to worsen kidney function. RV equalizers, these are patients who have a very high RA pressure compared to the LA pressure. They have a very bad RV compared to the LV. So we're looking at the RA whenever we're estimating the volume and we think we just keep diuresing them when they're intravascularly really dry. The, L, the, the, the LV cannot push any more blood into the kidneys. While we're diuresing, we're actually de like dehydrating them. So and they get volume depleted and they get an AKI. So these are the patients that whenever, that's why whenever an, an AKI happens or increased kidney function happens whenever you know, they're admitted uh, uh, after the third day of diuresis and you still think their volume up and it's really going more than 25% of, of whatever the previous number is, that's when I throw in a right heart cath because I wanna see if the output is low or is the LA filling pressure or like the wedge pressure is actually low but the RA pressure is big, that's, in that case, we cannot diurese them anymore. We have to stop, we have to hold. Over diuresis, it's quite often, again, what we mentioned about the, uh, the plasma refill rate and surpassing it. And uh, ascites, intra-abdominal intra pressure, if you find this, you know, taking that fluid off can help relieve the, the kidney. Things to avoid is stopping diuretics when, when they're clinically overloaded. Uh, we can slow down if, the, if there is worsening kidney function, but keep diuresing to dry. We do not diurese to, uh, do not stop diuresis. Uh, aggressive iatrogenic frank hypotension. Whenever somebody comes in, we have a theory of vasodilating someone for reducing afterload, which is not a bad idea, but we should not frankly get someone hypotensive because the kidney would not like it and get hyperperfusion and an AKI as well. All right, these are the definitions. We're not going to go over them. Uh, very, very quick. Um, Reminder about the, you know, the, what, what so-called GDMT, I don't know what really that means because for everything there's a guideline and if we throw a GDMT for, for pneumonia, we're going to be in trouble. So uh, big names are beta blockers. These are the quad therapy now for heart failure. Beta blockers, ARNI, which is Entresto. And if you cannot use ARNI, then you can use an ACE. If you cannot use an ACE after ARNI, then you can use an ARB. Uh, so this is the protocol and the SGLT2 inhibitor and the MRA, which is aldactone. I have to say aldactone is the least used medication in heart failure. It proved 25% reduce in, in whole cause mortality as a risk reduction. That was in the last trial a couple of years ago. I mean, actually more than 10 years ago. It is fascinating how significant the study is and how we do not use this medicine. It's just really fascinating. We use it quite often for cirrhotic patients, but not much for heart failure patients. So we have to jump on it as much as we can uh, to, you know, to add on. SGLT2, I like to add it in-house if somebody has insurance. And I like to think about ARNI in-house if somebody has insurance all the time. And uh, MRAs, whenever I'm diuresing someone, I'm throwing, about, I'm, throwing, I'm throwing aldactone if they can tolerate from blood pressure standpoint, because that will remind me to discharge them with it. Iron therapy, there is a, you know, a small benefit uh, you know, around readmission and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and symptom. Uh, you know, parts and stuff, not really hard evidence, not really hard endpoints. I use it sometimes, I quite actually, I use it quite often. If the SAT is less than 20%, I use IV iron. This is kind of the protocol that, that they came up with and it's been studied quite often and it's positive, but again, it's not really hard endpoints. All right, three minutes. Uh, so uh, the reason I put this on, as you can see, it's a 2A. And again, it's just improved the functional status and the quality of life. It's not really to improve any heart endpoints. The big thing is, and I see this all the time, there's a harm in keeping the EPO on patients who uh, are in acute decompensation. So we should stop this right away whenever I see someone with acute decompensation on with a CKD stage three or four or whatever, and they're on EPO four or, or Darby or whatever, we have to stop it because there's a high risk of increase of, of, of thrombogenicity. Uh, uh, so we have to stop it as soon as. That's the only reason I put this one in. Um, half path and, and half with, with, with mid-range. 
as you can see with HFPF, no better blockers. So please do me a favor, HFPF better blockers. It's not indicated. Actually, there are a couple of trials that started last year and they're going on now to look if we can increase heart rate in, in HFPF if that would improve symptoms. Actually, they went over to putting pacemakers and see if that would get them better. And if the first study started with increasing the heart rate on people who had pacemakers to see if they would get symptoms better, and that was positive. So the tendency now to stop beta blockers and have PEF patients. There is no indication, no need, unless there is a significant coronary disease and, and, and angina. Different story or AFib or whatever, all these kind of different indications, but not for half PEF, not for blood pressure control. As you can see with half PEF, the there is no clear indication for any treatment. Throwing in an FGLT2 inhibitor, uh, if they're not diabetic, it's just more than an expensive diuretic than actually a drug that would help improve any outcomes. So I do not use it unless someone is diabetic uh, because I think it's just really expensive for using it as a Lasix or an ad uh, adjunct to Lasix. Uh, mildly reduced, it's kind of different because we like to think about people who are less than 45% as if they are half ref because it can be just changing tomorrow. Whoever is using the echo today might not be the same person tomorrow and he might treat it 40%. And now what? We have no medications on him. So anybody who's less than 45%, I tend to add on better blockers and, and ACE, ARB, ARNIs, and SVLT2. Anybody above 45, I kind of, I'm hesitant, but uh, you know, I use SVLT2 if they're, you know, if they're diabetic and ACE, ARB for hypertension and stuff. So um, it kind of depends on, on the clinical picture and blood pressure control, but I'm just, just remember less than 45, I would use it. Readiness for discharge, we have to remember, it's not when, when I look at him and I, and I say, well, if he came to the clinic, I would not, I would not, uh, I would not admit him. It's not, it's not the point when we admit someone with heart failure. They have to be dry, mommy dry. They have to be really dry before discharge because the driver for outcome, let me just put this slide, this is my favorite slide. And I could not find this study, by the way, I looked really hard, but I just copied it from the guideline uh, PowerPoint. So, Mortality risk is, dri is, is driven by high filling pressures, not by cardiac index. It's very, very, it tells you, tells you a whole lot, which means if somebody has volume on him on discharge, they're actually dying faster than somebody has a low cardiac index at discharge, which means they're in walking cardiogenic shock. So, so remember that the reason someone to dry at discharge is what we have to go to and not to, well, if you go to the clinic, I would, I would not admit you. I don't think this has to be our purpose. It has to be dry to dry weight, tell them what the dry weight is, and, and, and then discharge them. There's a lot of evidence. Actually, I just included a couple of studies, but there are a ton of it to actually tell us that dry discharge is very significant. They, they, they you know, invented a couple of um, score risks and stuff. It's all depending on the JVD, orthopnea, and lower extremity edema. As you can see, all of these, you know, they just came up with a couple of scores, congestion score, if you want to look at it. I'm not sure it's, it means a whole lot. It just, you know, dry them up when, when, when you discharge them. Uh, as you can see, somebody who has more than three, more than three signs of congestion, they actually die much, much faster, like 59%, which is pretty big. So um, dry before discharge. And I think I skipped a couple, but you know, it's fine. I think we're on time. I think that was a fantastic talk, Hassan. Well, thank you. Anybody wants to throw a question before uh, we switch? Well, you can just stop me anytime and talk to me about Lasix. You know, I would enjoy it. So, yes, we're going to have to come up with another topic for you. This was wonderful. <laughs> okay. All right. I guess everybody will hop on over to Team Hall. Thanks so much, Hassan. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.